I'm, I'm honored to be here and, and, and excited about what I've already learned in addition to the research I did before arriving and really excited about the uh, possibilities of having more new market tax credits uh, allocated in Indian country and that's why we're here. Um, so I'm a, I'm a member of the Cherokee tribe, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee tribe and the citizen Potawatomis were nice enough to give a Cherokee boy a job. So I'm very grateful for them. So on behalf of the Cherokee people, what do? And on, pa on behalf of the uh, citizen Potawatomi nation, Megwitch. Um, also, uh, just to kind of tie back into uh, Sharon Day's um, blessing ceremony, I thought was uh, really appropriate. And I really appreciate those uh, when we acknowledge uh, the past and acknowledge uh, the paths that took each of us here. And um, I remember the, uh, we came through North Carolina to Georgia and from Georgia after we lost a lawsuit um, against the state of Georgia in Worcester versus Georgia and started the Trail of Tears that ultimately led us into Oklahoma. It was the Worcester family who were missionaries to the Cherokee Indians and they weren't Cherokee themselves, but they believed in justice. And they believed it was wrong for the state of Georgia to take uh, the tribe's land away from the Cherokee Nation. And it, that, that court, that, uh, they sued on behalf of the Cherokee Nation because we couldn't sue as citizens. And um, we won that Supreme Court case. And uh, Marshall uh, ruled in favor of the Cherokee Nation, said the Wooster family were correct. It was wrong for them to do that. But the president, uh, Andrew Jackson, said, well, let Marshall enforce his ruling. And by the time the delegation of elders got back to their homes in Georgia, there were already people living in their homes. But history matters. And what I'd like to acknowledge here is we've got a lot of tribal elders, tribal representatives, um, tribal leaders, and we also have a lot of Woosters in the audience. Those of you who genuinely care about justice, who care about aligning capital with justice, that are here and are passionately giving your time, talent, treasure to moving us forward and correcting some, some issues of the past. So on behalf of those natives in the room, I'd like to say to those who your tribe is justice, Thank you for what you do uh, for Indian country. Um, Chairman Barrett taught me a prayer with the, uh, with the Potawatomi Nations, and it's their most sacred prayer. It's a very simple prayer, um, but I think it really brings together what we're doing here today. And it is, in a word, it says, we're acknowledging our past, we're acknowledging the current generation, and we're investing in the future generation. And, and uh, that prayer is, is uh, Jaganaganan. So I want to remind us we're here today uh, because of confluence of trails, some trails of tears, trails of passion, and we're investing in the future of Indian country. And for generations we may never meet, but we'll build on what we build today. So on behalf of, of the Potawatomi Nation and for all of you here, Jaganaganan, for our ancestors and for our future. So we have a fantastic lineup today of individuals who have experience, and I'm in a unique position in that we are looking into going into the new market tax credits with the Citizen Potawatomi Community Development Corporation. In 2014, we looked seriously at the new market tax credits, and I can tell you frankly, my staff was very trepidatious about taking on the paperwork, um, a lot of uh, QLICs and, and LICs and all the acronyms, and we decided instead to go after the Guarantee Bond Program, which wasn't much less complicated. Um, and I, my promise to my staff was, if we ever get to a point where we can't do it on our own with our internal talent, then we'll hire the necessary people to help us. And we managed to do it. We worked very closely with OFN, and we went to the Guaranteed Bond Program. And another reason why we decided not to is because the, uh, if you get an allocation, you can't invest in your own projects. And, um, and we had $53 million of shovel-ready projects at the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, so we decided to align with two other uh, CDFIs so that we could be their allocatees, and we provided our pipeline projects to them, began to identify the types of projects necessary to qualify, and so we began to um, add to their pipeline. So Rural Enterprises, REI out of Oklahoma, and Metafund with Tom Loy, we provided him with our projects with the caveat that if he uh, or either of the organizations received allocations that they would consider doing some of the projects that we provided. 
And so that worked out very well. Also, Tom Loy, we asked him to join our board uh, because he had the gray matter necessary to kind of guide us. But his caveat was, as long as I'm on the board, I don't want you to compete for new market tax credits. <laughs> And so we needed his, his expertise on the board, and so we agreed to that. Uh, he left our, our board last year, and so this year will be the first year we actually are looking for uh, our own allocation of new market tax credits. And the reason for that is, one, we like to be in control, and we like to uh, uh, control our own destiny and be in the driver's seat, uh, because that's the only way we can guarantee that uh, our interests are being looked after. But the other reason is the 8.5 that uh, Karen Williams was pointing out that stays with the uh, CDE. Um, we need to build our capital because we've leveraged quite a bit. We got 25 million from USDA. We got 16 million from the Guarantee Loan, Pro uh, loan Program from CDFI Fund, and we're, we're leveraged and we need to add to the capital. So this is one of the strategies we're looking at for adding to our capital, so we can go out and get more capital. So that's kind of our story. So my, I'm here to learn with you and hopefully uh, guide the conversation to answer the questions that are in my mind. Also might be some of the questions that we, I expect will be in your mind as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have uh, to my immediate right, Dakota Cole. And Dakota has a very impressive and, and long uh, bio, so I've gone through and hit some highlights, Dakota. Um, so Dakota is a citizen of and employee of the unconquered and unconquerable Chickasaw Nation and uh, currently serves as the Deputy Secretary of Commerce. And I did that for Governor Anna Tubby. Yeah. I think he would, he would like that I said that. Um, Cole serves on a number of financial capacities from March 2010 through April 2017 before accepting his current role. As a Deputy Secretary, he oversees a number of tribal businesses and 7,000 team members. He is a strong advocate for alternative financing, leveraging of new technologies, and continuous workforce development. He serves on a number of boards, uh, Mercy out of Ada, uh, Sovereign Properties, Sovereign Investments, Global Gaming Solutions. Um, he's also uh, the Manager Director of the Chickasaw Nation Community Development Endeavors, LLC. He has a Bachelor's of Business Administration, a Master's Degree in Accounting. Uh, he is from Connerville, Oklahoma and his wife, Jamie, and uh, his two children, Connor and Creek, have agreed to lend him to us today to share his expertise. This is Dakota Cole. To his right, we have, he gave me a pronunciation guide, I hope I don't butcher this, uh, Wayne Ducheneau. Ducheneau. Wayne Ducheneau. And he is, uh, Wayne is an enrolled member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. He grew up on his parents' cattle ranch in Cheyenne River Indian Reservation. His work for his tribes includes running the Cheyenne River Motel, a tribal enterprise, serving two years as the tribal administrative officer, serves the people of the Cheyenne River as a District 4 Council representative. He was selected for a two-year term as vice chairman of the tribe from 2012 to 2014. He is an alumnus of the Native Nation Rebuilders Program from Cohort 3, and Wayne started his employment with the uh, Native Governance Center in January of 2016 as the executive director. So, gentlemen, thank you for uh, sharing your time with us and, uh, and expertise with uh, fellow leaders here in the room. So let's just kind of start, if you will, kind of um, talk to us how you were introduced to the New Market Tax Credit Program and, um, and what roles that you played and how did you decided what roles to play for your respective organizations. So, uh, Dakota, would you like to start us off? Absolutely. Shane, you're doing a wonderful job, but uh, I, I hate to follow you, to be honest. <laughs> Nonetheless, we'll, we'll do, our, do our best. Uh, can, you, can you hear him okay? Check and see if your microphone's on. It's, it's on. You might have to hold Check, it. check. Can you hear him better? No, yes. All right. I used to be a school teacher, so I can use Works my you're in trouble voice. I'll project to the back of the room. Yeah, I can certainly project if you all cannot hear me. Yeah, excellent. I mean, I've, I've got it on. I don't... Okay. Great. Well, I, too, want to extend my thanks and appreciation to Mishu, Patrice, and Jackie for their, um, for their hosting of today's event. This is a great opportunity and, and one that uh, I think will uh, provide tremendous dividends to Indian country. also want to extend my thanks to the CDFI Fund uh, for their partnership. They continue to uh, 
offer a hand uh, to Indian Country, whether it be through their minority CDE program uh, or other pathways. But in terms of the New Markets Tax Credit Program, I mean, I want you all to know I, I'm from southern Oklahoma, um, grew up in a very small community. I still live in the middle of nowhere. Uh, never thought I'd wear a tie or a suit. I grew up on a ranch, too. I still ranch uh, just kind of as a, as a hobby that I can't kick. Um, and and intro being introduced to New Marcus Tax Credits was very intimidating. Uh, and in essence, it was in partnership with Mr. Andy McMillan with Cherokee Nation Businesses Community Development Entity. And he actually met with us in Norman, Oklahoma, us being the, the Chickasaw Nation and, and our team members. And he and his then director communicated uh, an opportunity to allocate these tax credits within Indian Country. And we partnered with the CDFI fund to expand their CDE service area so that we could, so they could make such an allocation. So they provided flexibility and we, we're certainly appreciative of that. And I believe that we underwrote and undertook one of the more challenging projects you could in Indian Country with a, a finite timeline. We were able to allocate tax credits to a former Indian Health Services facility that was on trust, uh, that was in need of reprogramming and re repair. The Chickasaw Nation had compacted with Indian Health Services in 1994, operated their health uh, uh, services there until 2010, and then relocated to a, a new facility south of Ada, Oklahoma. And so there was a 130,000 square foot facility sitting there dormant in a severely distressed census tract in Ada, Oklahoma. And so we were able to underwrite a property that was on trust with a leasehold interest, go through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the solicitor's office, get their approval, orient our chief magistrate, our governor of the Chickasaw Nation, Governor Bill Anatubby, make submittal via legislative resolution to our uh, lawmakers, our 13 elected officials, and provide a leveraged loan through fund balance reserves to this new entity, and oh, by the way, work with U.S. Bank as a new markets tax credit investor and meet all of their needs as a new low-income community business. So that was kind of where we cut our teeth. And honestly, we didn't know any better. We just stuck our head down and moved straight into the headwind until someone told us to stop. And luckily, they just asked us to stop. They didn't make us stop. And on, in December of, of 2014, I believe it was, it may have been 2013, uh, we closed that that particular transaction and and we're I'm happy to say that the Carl Albert Service Center is a multi-use space that provides uh, orientation it provides uh, a place uh, of workforce development for our people uh, we ha we house our Chickasaw Institute there uh, and it is really the epicenter for the Chickasaw Nation governmental programs and services and it's a beautiful facility, and it has really uh, met the, the mission of the New Markets Tax Credit Program in terms of increasing the economic velocity of money supply in, in that space. So that's where we cut our teeth. And if, if it wasn't for folks like Andy McMillan, uh, uh, folks within the CDFI fund, allowing for them to extend their service area and the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, and others, we, we wouldn't have got that done. So that's how we cut our teeth. And since then, we've also uh, participated in two additional transactions as low-income community businesses because that's where, the, that's where the real impact is for Indian country, and that's being a low-income community business. We have actually completed $41 million worth of transactions. And it's included the multi-use space I just spoke to you about. 
It included the renovation of a dilapidated bowling alley in a severely distressed census tract that now houses our culture and humanities program, our uh, Chickasaw Press, our bookstore, and that that is really, really neat to see an old bowling alley that was fixing to, I mean, literally fall down. And now it's a, it's a beautiful property uh, with um, impactful programs and services and our own bookstore. It, I'm just very proud to say we were part of that program. And then lastly, we've uh, participated as a low-income community business in an outpatient surgical center. And as you know, Indian country typically finds itself in these health professional shortage areas, typically food deserts, and there's real need to provide local outpatient surgical centers and so our surgical services and we've been able to do that as well. So that's how we cut our teeth in terms of low-income community businesses. It was through that process that we identified an opportunity to to seek a community development entity certification and were able to do that successfully and was awarded uh, the, a national CDE certification which allows us to allocate credits throughout all of Indian country um, including uh, Alaskan Native corporations and Native Hawaiian communities and we're th thankful uh, to have received an allocation of 20 million dollars in our initial application round and have since allocated those credits to three very very deserving projects across the Indian country one in a health clinic for the Lackview Desire Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians in Watersmeet, Michigan, not, not too far from here. Uh, another in a mixed-use uh, live-work community for the Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska, which is located in the only persistent poverty county in the state of Nebraska. And lastly, uh, in a workforce development center in a 501c3 nonprofit Native Hawaiian organization that's focusing on developing Native Hawaiians' ability to provide uh, health care through LPN, uh, CNA, and then also CDLs and other sort of technical certifications that are now demanded in today's knowledge-based economy. So we're very proud of what we've been able to do thus far. And <clears throat> we have recently received an allocation of $30 million through the most recent funding round and are taking to our advisory board uh, two very, very impactful projects, um, and then we'll soon be taking a third uh, before the end of, of June. So we, we are acting through our CDE uh, just as, a, I mean, honestly, just a, a helping hand. Uh, you're making ends meet in terms of receiving these, this amount of allocation, and we just want to pay it forward. I mean, that's... Our governor uh, has served in that role for now his eighth term. He, he's been an uh, employee of the Chickasaw Nation for 42 years, and we live and breathe our mission, and that's to enhance the overall quality of life of Chickasaw people. Nevertheless, he speaks adamantly about lifting up all of Indian country, and so that's why we're in this space. I'll, I'll be honest with you, Shane, uh, and to the audience, I serve as Deputy Secretary of Commerce and we have a, a number of businesses, but this one certainly uh, hits home and we, we just do it so that, so that you all can better understand how to utilize these, these credits, that we can get these credits deployed to, to very advantageous projects. And we look forward to, uh, I'll call it uh, cooperation. I mean, we'd love for many of you all to, to make allocation or make application to the CDFI fund. Uh, we certainly don't want to be the only recipient or, or one of the few recipients. We encourage you all to, to make application because any country deserves more utility of this program. It needs us to leverage this program. And though it may seem complex, uh, and it is, it is appropriate for our people because 
we move forward unwaveringly uh, with great resolve and tenacity, and, and I think uh, we are poised to, to leverage this program program further. And I can also speak to uh, Shane whenever you'd like. We've served as leverage lender. We've brought in true leverage financing. Uh, we've done it through our uh, fund balance within our tribal government. Um, we we feel like there's an opportunity to to marry the investor community and the lender so that you can have appropriate safeguards. Uh, for uh, moreover, there's a an appropriate uh, partnership already established for a refi uh, post compliance period too, uh, and probably most importantly, uh, some of the tax credit investors have some some pretty high watermarks in terms of waiver of sovereignty, uh, indemnities that they seek out, and it's important uh, you know, for our government as well as many of you all's governments to maintain sovereignty, to uh, express sovereignty, and, and thus if you increase the new market tax credit investor community with those banks you've already done business with as a leverage lender, they're, they're one, uh, they're more understanding of, of the importance of sovereignty, and two, you've got a refi option just as soon as the compliance period's over. And we've also worked with other tribes that their council was a little bit hesitant uh, to meet the partnership criteria required by uh, the uh, Internal Revenue Code, and so we've provided minority equity interest to meet the, the respected entity criteria just as another way to pay it forward and we just underwrite preferential returns at an appropriate period just so that they too become uh, uh, users of this of this program and that's the Choctaw, Na Choctaw Nation specifically. So there's many opportunities and I just encourage you all after you receive all of this information today, know that it can be deployed in any country. You absolutely can do it and take it from someone that I, I had no idea what these acronyms were four or five years ago. I mean, they, REI, Andy, you sat down. I mean, I don't know how many times you had to go back over the flow chart. And, and so since then, uh, we, we know that it is doable. Um, and it really just it takes uh, a commitment. It's not gaming. It's not IHS compacting, joint venture compacting. It's not authoring of grants. Uh, it is more challenging. But with, with that challenge comes, comes great returns. And, and I'll just tell you that you earn a lot of respect in the finance community, the capital markets community if you've been able to close one of these transactions. And so uh, it really, really provides some tailwinds in terms of other types of leverage financing, and we can speak to that too. But I'll, I'll be quiet and, and uh, wait for Shane to kick me off again. But next time, shut me up sooner. Oh, okay. You, I've got that. Uh, yeah. So uh, real, real quickly, just a quick uh, recap. Um, we have up here terms of that, uh, that, that Karen and Rosa were going over, so just kind of remind you as you're, you're taking notes. And so to begin with, you were approached by the Cherokee Nation, mm -hmm. and that's how you kind of kicked off the project. So you, were you a uh, uh, qualified, active, low-income low community business, Qualic B? We, we were not. That's what we established after learning. Uh, we uh, didn't know what that meant. <laughs> but after they said, hey, you might consider establishing a low-income community business, which for us ended up being an LLC that elected to be taxed as a C-Corp to meet the criteria uh, for our tax credit investor. And the only reason we went ahead and did the C-Corp is because we had a, an appropriate level of short-term assets uh, coupled with the fact that it was on trust, so we also leveraged the uh, expedited uh, cost recovery versus the typical 39 and a half year straight line uh, depreciation. We were able to leverage the 22 year uh, straight line depreciation and we had appropriate uh, net operating loss carry forward that when we wind it down, 
in seven years. It doesn't uh, catalyze a tax liability. So we were able to underwrite all that in that first one with U.S. Bank. So, so they don't necessarily have to become an, uh, an allocatee to get an allocation to benefit. They could actually reach out to, to, to you or Cherokee Nation, mm -hmm. and what they need to do is identify types of projects that would qualify mm -hmm. uh, because you can't give it to them your, yourself. Right. We need partnerships in order for this to work. So there's there's different levels that you can participate in. We also have some banks here in the area. Mm -hmm. um, or is it always the larger banks or some of the smaller banks also interested in buying? No, smaller banks credit? are absolutely interested. We've partnered with U.S. Bank, uh, Wells Fargo, but we've also partnered with local regional banks like Landmark Bank, mm -hmm. which was established in Tishomingo, Oklahoma, our historic capital. And though they knew nothing about tax credits, we oriented, oriented them to the benefits of tax credit investing, and they've since invested in two of our uh, subsequent projects. And again, that's one of those benef uh, benefits is having them as an investor as well as providing credit, and then that immediate refi partner post uh, new markets close, Very good. new markets compliance. Well, I'm going to follow up with you in a little bit about Bank 2, so, so mm -hmm. be thinking about how they might fit into this mm -hmm. uh, equation. Absolutely. Let's go to Wayne. <laughs> Wayne Ducheneau is going to talk to us about his experience and uh, go back to the original question. How were you introduced to it, yep. and how did you choose to participate, and how did that unfold for you? So first of all, thank you. My name is uh, Wayne Ducheneau. I said, good morning, my relatives. I, I greet you with an open uh, heart, welcoming heart, and a handshake. Uh, my introduction to the new market tax credits came in about 2010 when I was back home working for the tribe. And I should let you guys all know today that anyone here that knows Lakota uh, Vogel from Four Bands, she's our executive director. She couldn't be here today, so I'm in her stead. So uh, I'm going to struggle through what she would more eloquently say. Um, but back in 2010, our tribe had actualized from the, or realized from the federal government a, a large trust fund for some flooded land that was taken back in the 50s. And so we had this, this extreme amount of money that we were looking to deploy in some way, shape, or form in our community. And so at the time, New Market Tax Credits, we had a, a pitch come in. We had a $10 million grocery store, convenience store expansion project ready to go. Um, so that's, I was the administrative officer then at the time, getting ready to transition onto the council. So that's when I first saw, I think Karen called it the clown face, New Market Tax Credit clown face. That's the first time I saw that face. Um, it was really good to hear that again this morning, um, to see the same drawing that I saw so many years ago. and know that it has changed a little bit, but not too much. Um, Just what I, funny. Huh? Just as funny. Just as funny today as it was then, yes, sir. Um, <laughs> But really what I'm here to talk about today, and I almost feel remiss, like it probably should be on the panel this afternoon when we're talking about challenges, because Lakota asked me to come talk to you guys about our Native Ninth LLC. And I don't know if very many people heard about the Native Ninth, but we were a conglomeration of four CDFIs within the uh, states of North or South Dakota, Minnesota, and Montana that tried to come together to apply as our own and to get some new market tax credits. We had some very good advice and assistance from the folks at the Midwest, Minnesota Midwest CDC, MMCDC. I don't know if Julia's here. Oh, there she is. I thought I was, okay, good. Hello. Um, so they helped us do our application. Um, and so with that experience as well, in one way, shape, or form, I think I've been looking at trying to participate in every one of these things that are listed below. Um, and so we, we came together, we applied, we had at the time identified $350 million in projects within our four reservations and surrounding Indian country. Uh, Cheyenne River alone, we had identified $186 million in projects. Um, uh, but what, what the barrier we came to is, although as four entities combined with over 50 years of experience in lending in Indian country, as the native ninth, we had none at the time. And so our first application failed. And so uh, really set us back, you know, uh, when we, when we first formed the, the Native Ninth LLC, it was with this dream to become a model in Indian country about how can we join CDFIs to not only gather assets and, and potential, but to and really grab a hold of this market, these new market tax credits, and deploy them in Indian country. All of our entities um, live within the Ninth District, which is encompassing some of the poorest, most disadvantaged uh, counties, reservations in the country. Uh, a lot of you are from here, so you're well aware of that. Um, and really, what we learned coming out of it, sorry, I got to scre uh, scroll to my notes because uh, Lakota would get me if I didn't get everything Astor said. 
Uh, like we said, we'd hoped to become a model that was replicated in Indian country. That was really the dream. Uh, what we did learn is we all know that new market tax credits consist of four parts, business strategy, community impact, management capacity, and capitalization. And these are some of the following incorrect uh, assumptions we made. We incorrectly assume that we would have difficulty writing the business strategy section as a new CDE and that we wouldn't be able to make a strong case for projected future activity. That's actually something we, after working through it with our help from the folks from MMCDC that we were actually able to really do that um, pretty well. Uh, we incorrectly assumed that we'd have issues with scale. That's one of the things we were worried about. Could we find enough projects? And like I talked about earlier, not only did we find them, I mean, they're prevalent within our, our communities. Uh, we also incorrectly assumed capitalization would not be as challenging due to our qualifying areas and presume investor interest in native issues would be tougher. Um, but many of our projects we had, like we had tr the tribes willing to invest as an investor to partner um, with the TCIs and everything. Uh, you know, specifically at Shine River, because I can speak a little bit more on that because I was on the council, with our $186 million we identified in projects, um, the thing that we had was coming up with the 80% financing uh, necessary to make the NT, the new market tax credit subsidy. And so those are, those are struggles that we, we all face, I think, with the tribes in this region today, is finding that capital. Um, so I wished I had more to talk about a successful, like you said it was hard to follow him, I find it extremely hard, hard to follow you, Dakota. Um, but those are really some lessons that we learned through this process. It was a tough go. I'm not discouraging anyone. In fact, I think meetings like this should happen more often, broader based. We should look to take these type of meetings regional um, because this information needs to get out there. It's one of the things like I was talking to this table earlier. I like to consider myself a fairly intelligent person. But even in this eight years, I don't think I've still fully grasped this stuff. I learned some new things in New Market Tax Credit 101 today that I've heard over and over and over. And this information needs to get out there. It needs to become prevalent and prevailing in our communities so that we fully understand and can actualize these opportunities. Very good. So um, you, you had trouble finding 80% of 186 million. Mm -hmm. um, how did you ultimately address that? Uh, who did you reach out to? What was? We, we tried, like I said, we had a, a plethora of banks that came in initially and were, and were pitching us some ideas. Like we had the trust fund established where we could have poured money into these things. Um, the, the, the real hurdle we, we faced and how many, are there any elected officials in here from a tribe? Many people that work with elected officials though, I'm assuming, right? Um, the, the, the overwhelming problem on the tribal side when I was there we faced was when this came and was pitched to us the first time, it seemed like that sweetheart deal. It's too good to be true. How can we actually have a $10 million project where we're only using, I mean, realize we're going to use $10 million and only, get, and only have to really account for $7 million, as the clown face describes? Um, and so we ended up not doing it. We ended up forging ahead on our own and trying a different route. Uh, with the Native Ninth LLC specifically, we just got to a point where we realized that because of our lack of track record in lending as an organization that we were going to have to try to find a different way, either becoming a leveraged lender or some other avenue. Um, we just couldn't get traction to do that either as coming together as our, our four CDFIs. We had uh, roughly $450,000 that we were trying to play with to, to do some things. We were, you know, really um, not wanting to overextend ourselves each individually because we have so much as CDFIs local at home. We have so much we have to do work within our own communities that what we really learned is we either had to go all in or not. And we recently decided to not go all in. and. Uh, I hope I'm, I'm probably breaking news, but Native Ninth dissolved just a few weeks ago. So um, what we hope to do, though, is be able to provide some reporting on, on that to not only share with our, our friends at the CDFI Fund, but Indian country in general about here's the issues we faced. Um, I've already heard with some of the issues on capacity and things that I know about right now, there's three solutions that I heard today already. And so just having, like I said, opportunities like this for, for people who are interested in getting into it convene these type of things so that we can get better involved. Mm -hmm. Now, one, one of the things that I, I did at the very front of the meeting, and there's some that have come in the back after, uh, after the fact, I gave each of you my business card. And I, I did that uh, not just so, so that, that you could have a nice picture of me that's four years old, um, <laughs> but also just a quick tip. If you flip that card over on the back, in the upper right-hand corner, I want you to write three things. One is today's date. The next thing is today's location. And the third thing is the why we're here. So in this case, it's learning about new market tax credits. And the reason I want you to do that, and I encourage you to share your cards with the other people in the room, 
and with the gentleman up here because everyone here is here for one primary reason. We want to know how to bless the Native communities that we represent. Mm -hmm. And we also need to connect with people that have the information we do not have. Because the truth in Indian country is if, if you have a problem that a friend of yours can resolve, you don't have a problem. You have a connectivity issue. You got to call your friend, right? And I'm just guessing with the philosophy that I know to be true with, with Governor Anatobi in Oklahoma, is they genuinely care about not just the Chickasaw Nation, but establishing precedents that allows other Native American communities to strive, to thrive and grow. Because we have our different trails of tears, trails of sorrow, trails of death, stories. All of us have struggled and overcome. And we relate to each other. And we like to share our stories and our, and our, our historical experiences, but we also like to share our expertise. That's why you're here. So on the next thing I want you to write on the back of that card, if you have it out in front of you, is my cell phone number. It's area code 405-476-7500. I care very passionately about this subject, and I care very passionately about aligning capital with justice in Indian country. Now, Dakota, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that if anyone in this room called to you and said, we would really like to talk to you about your experience, or could you share with us some examples? Could we pick your brain? Would you take that phone call? Yeah, it's 580-279-3919. That's my cell as well. You can text, call. So or email me anytime. That's 580-279-3919. Now, Wayne, does that, that also apply to you if, if they reached out to want to learn from your experiences? Yes, and I'll give you my cell phone. 605-200-1064. We've actually done this, Shane, a couple of different times when Indian uh, nations were thinking about establishing CDEs. We told them the good, the bad, and the ugly about it. So, do it. so I actually had a, a uh, I sent out an invitation to tribal leaders all over the United States from our office in Oklahoma, and uh, I've had some to call, contact me and said, can we come and side saddle with you and your staff? We want to open a CDFI. It wasn't just the new market tax credits. They wanted to start at the bottom. How do we begin? Mm -hmm. And I said, look, tell us what works for you. We'll set aside some time. You can come to each of our, our stations, meet each of my employees. Um, you stay at the, the casino uh, hotel and resort, and we'll show you what we do. We'll answer your questions and cultivate that dialogue um, because there's more demand and need in Indian country, as you know, than there's capital to meet it with a case in point from Wayne's example. All right, so let's, let's talk real quickly. I know we have some, uh, we recently had a conference um, at the Citizen Potawatomi Casino with, with Native bankers. We have Jeff here. There's others, I think, from, from Native banks right here in the back, okay, uh, out of Colorado. Um, Bank two, have they participated in the new market tax credits? Is that something that they're looking at with the Chickasaw Nation? <clears throat> Bank two has not participated. However, it is the only C corporation other than the low-income community business that I mentioned prior that the Chickasaw Nation owns. And we are working diligently with them and their council, and it's in partnership so that they can become, if nothing else, a tax credit investor to offset the tax liability that we hope they generate over the coming seven years. So uh, they have not been involved, but will be, and very soon. They also may participate as a leveraged lender in a, a very uh, neat project that we're underwriting right now. You may have heard of it. It's American Indian Cultural Center and Museum in, in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I look for them to be a, a real game changer in this space in the not too distant future under new leadership. Can you anticipate um, creating a consortium of native owned banks uh, that Bank Two would be a part of um, that could begin purchasing some of the new market tax credits as their capacity extends? If they've established themselves uh, as a corporation, we acquired that status and haven't changed it due to regulatory issues. But yeah, if, if tribes have acquired through their diversification efforts entities that are that have tax liability then they should absolutely consider uh, serving as tax credit investors and they could absolutely s create a consortium so that they could uh, leverage uh, this opportunity within Indian country. I believe we have a question Jeff. 
So in your experiences, are some tribal projects better suited than others? So like I've heard mention of a convenience store, a truck stop. I'm a banker guy. That business generates ongoing revenues. So you can have the leveraged loan and you have cash flows to service that debt. And then on the other end, it's we're going to do this cultural center. As a nerdy numbers guy, I'm like, what revenues can a program in a community generate to pay back that debt? So, you know, I'm trying to, you know, which projects just, you know, nine out of ten times always, hey, that's probably a good fit for the program. And then this one, if it doesn't generate revenue, it's a cultural center or a library or a community center, how do you pay back the debt? How do you, how yeah, do you work through that? you're talking about true credit, um, then you, you've got to find those projects that meet the criteria for the New Markets Tax Credit Program that have uh, cash flows that, that you can underwrite and that you can understand. And when we bring in true credit, to our low-income community businesses, it's real estate uh, with foreseeable tenant revenues through some sort of triple net uh, lease criteria that, that uh, makes sense. So for instance, the Ambulatory Surgical Center, there's four surgeons and an operating entity that guarantee for the next 15 years an inflation-adjusted triple net lease per square foot that provided up to 1.8 times debt service coverage at the outset. So that's when we pr bring in traditional credit. You absolutely hit the nail on the head. It's like, how do you underwrite some of uh, these cultural initiatives? You and the, for you can self leverage. You lend the money? Yes. Yeah, so you could take your, the tribal government's uh, credit worthiness. Uh, like, for instance, Chickasaw Nation maintains a triple B credit rating. And you could have the a true creditor provide capital to the government. Then the government serve as the leverage lender. And essentially the government provides the guarantee or the necessary backing so that the creditor can become comfortable. Yeah. And you sometimes we identify even, we get very specific in terms of revenue streams. If the government isn't well capitalized, or doesn't have appropriate liquidity. So if it's not a project that generates revenue, not going like that. Jeff, can you use the mic? Sorry. Sorry. So if it's not a project like a truck stop or a or a grocery store that has ongoing revenues, you gotta figure out the way to find those cash flows from a mm -hmm. different project, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm-hmm. Can you use the bowling but, alley example? Yeah, so the bowling alley uh, in that particular situation, uh, Culture and Humanities, tribal government signed a 15-year lease uh, to pay uh, beginning $22 per square foot with an inflation-adjusted uh, rent annually. So that became the cash flow to pay the leverage loan. You create yep. the cash flow. You create, yep. you basically, the government uh, or the, the uh, tenant or the low-income community business has a proxy from the tribal government. And in this case, it was the Department of C Culture and Humanities and their secretary. Yeah. Jeff, could you identify your bank for the rest in the room so they'll know? So yeah, my name is Jeff and um, I'm from Oneida. Uh, the Oneida tribe owns a bank named Bay Bank. And we're one of 18 tribally owned banks in the country. And so we do a lot of different stuff in Indian country. You have tax liability? We well not right now because we had uh, losses uh -huh. going back a few years ago that we still haven't drawn down all okay. all that. But a few years from now, mm -hmm. I think in in 2020 we've utilized all that. Mm -hmm. So like 2021, yes sir. You know, there's an opportunity for us to to maybe help out on the and, and I would on the encourage investor you, side. I would encourage you to go ahead and introduce this to your council. Uh, general counsel or and see if they can't begin to so orient the bank, themselves. And I and I appreciate the bank operates separate from council. The, yeah. the tribe is just the shareholder. So it's really up to us as management to figure out what kind of spaces do we It's actually referring to general counsel, I'm sorry. Your attorney. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Go ahead and orient your attorney. Yeah, okay. Because it so. that that can be just as trying as the tribal government. 
<laughs> yeah, you don't. They're good folks. All right, we have a question from Ted Piccolo from, from your board member. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Um, Dakota, you mentioned earlier that uh, the tribal business that went into the bowling alley was a subchapter S corporation? No, sir. Uh, I, the, my mention to a corporation was Bank 2, uh, which also has a CDFI, but they are a C corporation. Okay. We haven't established any entities under subchapter S. Okay. But even the C corp, is that C corp, is that, um, is that as of um, it meets the criteria of the tribe's corporate code? Is that? Uh, <clears throat> the... Chickasaw Nation is the parent entity for Chickasaw Bank Holdings. Okay. And then Chickasaw Bank Holdings is the whole uh, whole owner of Bank Two, and which then was Bank what Two we acquired. Is um, is um, uh, a standard FDIC uh, yes, sir. capacity lender. That's correct. Okay. And the reason we acquired that entity, and like I said, it's the only entity that has tax liability because in most cases we are utilizing limited liability companies either domiciled in the state of Oklahoma because we're oriented to that law or the state of Delaware and we leverage the disregarded entity criteria uh, and the flow back to the tribal government to not uh, incur a tax liability for any earnings we might harvest from those entities. Okay, and I appreciate the question because in our particular case, um, the tax liability would be a prohibitor for us uh, under our constitution, our tribal constitution. We're not allowed to create a taxable estate mm -hmm. uh, owned by the tribe. So I, I better understand that now and I thank you for that. Hey, Kenneth, before you give up the mic, can you go ahead and identify for the rest of the group who you, who you represent? Oh, I'm Ken Stanger. I'm from the Colville tribe and I Done. I'm glad to see the Oneidas. I did the original casino. I did their lease for the shop co. I did their retail property 100 years ago. I've had a chance to work with those guys over the last 25 years, so it's good to see you. <laughs> and I anyone else who asks a question, if you go ahead and just identify who you are and who you're with, because there's a lot of people not in this room that are going to be learning from us, so they'll know how to reach back out to you, okay? Um, let's, let's real quickly, if there's no other questions, talk about how to identify projects that are in the sweet spot. Um, we, we look at projects that are, some are too small. Um, sometimes they say it needs to be at least $5 million. Uh, you mentioned a $10 million project. Uh, talk to us a little bit of how you identify those and what, what you perceive as the sweet spot. You want to take first crack or me too? Sorry, are we asking me? Wayne, go ahead. So for us, for our sweet spot, when we were uh, gathering that huge list as Native Ninth, it was just really those that would rise above the $5 million threshold. Um, I'm really interested to hear more about, hopefully later today, about some of the innovative ways that people are finding to loan under the $5 million threshold, because I think there's a lot more demand, at least in the work I've seen in Indian country for those type of things. But when we were looking, it was trying to ascertain projects of $5 million or greater, those that were as close to shovel ready as possible, because again, without, with the lack of investors that we had in our work, getting that 80% 80, 80 threshold was tough, and so we were just trying to find ways to get as close to that 80% and over five million as possible. We focus our underwriting on the people and less about size. Um, at the end of the day, because there are very few in any country that understand how to leverage this, this program, we need, typically we try to find citizens that have the same passion that you all have, that want to pay it forward, but have developed some intellectual capacity uh, in in this particular, in, in that business domain. For instance, health center, someone that's managed large health centers mm -hmm. in urban areas and have since come back to the res and willing to commit uh, to, to doing these types of projects, that's what gets these deals done, not the size, Shane. It, it, I mean, we've done four million, we've done 30 million, all within a single transaction. You'll figure out a way to, to get across the finish line if you have the right people involved. 
And that's, that's the importance uh, that we realize quickly and continue to, to underwrite appropriately. It's about the management team. And yes, for appropriate economies reasons, uh, you probably need to be north of that $4 million mark. We've done some $4 million projects, but nonetheless, we're underwriting people as much as we are cash flows and deal size. Very good. And um, we recently had, I mentioned the, uh, the native owned or, or native American family owned bank conference we had in Oklahoma a few weeks ago. Jeff was there. And uh, one of the banks there is uh, Oklahoma State Bank, I believe, up in uh, Benita. And it's owned by a Cherokee family. And he reached out to me, and I haven't had a chance to, to dig through his numbers, but he said he's figured out a way to do a million dollar project instead of the $5 million target, but it's predicated on a $0.55 cent per uh, payout instead of the 80% from, like, U.S. Bank would pay 80% or Bank of America. Mm -hmm. He's looking at a 55 So I haven't run through the, the numbers, but it looks like he may have figured out how to do a smaller one, um, which, which also it highlights one of the problems that we have in Indian country is the access to capital. We keep banging our head against the access to capital. Uh, for example, we go to Washington, D.C., and we say we want to not have a match requirement for native CDFIs because if you put a match requirement, there's a de facto denial of access to capital because the nearest bank is 60 miles away and the nearest Rotary Club is 60 miles away. So you can't just get in a, a napkin and put that all together at a Rotary Club because there aren't any. Jeff. So that, what that would suggest is the investor says... I need a certain economic return. I'll pay 55 cents for the tax credit instead of 80 cents just because I it's too little of a deal, right? Is that yeah, what I mean, that's you're, trying you're to gonna, imply? You're going to erode 8% of the ultimate 20 that you hope to harvest from the project yep, yep. Uh, on a pro-rated pro basis. So you're still willing to do it, but I so less dollars come into right. the, the thing. Right. I think you can still do it, though. The thing about it is you've got to have the right tax credit investor and the right leverage lender. That's why if you marry the two with these local community banks, their comfort level is much higher, and you don't have to have all the attorneys and the 27 different versions of the underwriting that's 150 pages. So here's a question for you guys and, and, and you, and having a working knowledge, and the, and the lawyer who presented earlier. Okay. So you get a... You're a CDE, you get a $50 million allocation. So you're going to have this company, and then let's say you make five $10 million investments. So you're going to have five little subsidiaries now that you own. Each one has legal and ongoing servicing, and each one has to have a financial audit mm -hmm. uh, every year. And so um, you have to do in theory, bigger transactions to justify paying all these ongoing fees for seven years and the unwind all that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's the setting. So my thought question is, just being a novice and learning, if each one was a $10 million project, but is there a way to stuff two projects that are $5 million each in one CDE so you're still kind of you know, you're still at that economies of scale kind of point where it's like, okay, it's not one ten million dollar project, but can we do two five million dollar projects in the same census tract, maybe the same community, and they're right next door to each other, and let's let's roll two of them into one CDE instead of having, you know, yeah. can you can yes. that, in theory could that work? Yeah, we've done it. Okay. So I'd like to re real quickly recognize Julia Nilmark in the back, uh, who has a lot of experience in new market tax credits. Would you like to take a stab at answering that? Okay, thanks. So um, MMCDC has financed um, about 95 projects with new markets, and half of those have been at or below $3 million. And we're doing exactly what Jeff spoke of there, with pooling together multiple smaller transactions. And the, the, there are two reasons we do that. One is to reduce the legal and accounting costs to get the transaction set up. And the second is to reduce the complexity for the smaller businesses who don't have the sophistication to do the large um, um, uh, sophisticated uh, debt structuring that some of those entail. 
And so our tax attorney worked with us and with U.S. Bank, and um, we've been doing those since we got into new markets in 0405 to to finance those smaller projects. And we've gone as low as $225,000 funding projects with new markets benefits. So the key for us has been to set up the new market structure with the investor and the attorneys and the accountants and the leverage lender, sometimes playing the part of the leverage lender ourselves and participating that out or keeping some of it with others and basically keeping the cost to set up the structure at that fifty to sixty thousand dollar range and then blending all those costs into the interest rate so that we can provide uh, comparable rates and debt forgiveness and such to the projects as we can with a standalone deal that then requires us to have form documents loan documents that the attorneys uh, review and approve in advance and then we draft them in house for each of the borrowers and we've used our local real estate attorney who is about a third of the cost as the tax attorneys to to review those record them what have you some of our borrowers we encourage them to have their own counsel some of them have have chosen not to have counsel but in every case we try to inform them and give them the opportunity to bring in as much um, assistance as they need to understand it but it, it takes a fair amount of time on our part to explain the process and the documents and the requirements and the liabilities that are involved there, but that's part of the process. So it is doable if, if there's the capacity on staff with the CDEs, and um, we've, we've worked with a couple other uh, large national banks to get into the loan funds as well. I gotta say US Bank has been the best one to do it with us. And there are some other CDEs who do that across the country um, with varying levels of expertise. So it's been done, it's possible, and um, um, we just closed something with Wind River a, a few months ago uh, for part of the broadband financing through a loan fund. So um, there's, there's the capacity there and possibility, certainly. Fantastic, thank you, Julia. So we've got about three minutes before our next break. Um, talking about first steps, one of the first things that we did, um, Dakota, is we, we applied for a CDE as soon as we said, okay, we're gonna look at new market tax credits. And so I asked my team to put the paperwork together and become a CDE, and we did that that year. And we felt like it was a pretty easy process to go through. So when you have applied for your CDEs, what was that experience like for, for the group? It was new to us at the time, so we were doing that and drafting an allocation application. It's very doable. Um, the challenging part for us, I don't know if you all applied for national status, but we, we made application as national CDE, and so we had a third-party underwriter from uh, that the CDFI had contracted with that was asking some, some very challenging questions they're really wanting to make sure the t's are crossed and the i's are dotted and we certainly appreciated that so uh, we didn't mind we we have you know have nothing to hide so we answered those questions uh, though they were a bit challenging and then just some of the boxes to check you know for profit or not for profit establishing a corporation versus meeting the partnership criteria because that was the big decision tree for us corporation or partnership we didn't have appropriate corporate code in that codified into our law we didn't want to take the time to wait on the nonprofit corporation status and subject ourselves to the 990 annual filings and all that good stuff so we're like okay we're not going to take the the nonprofit we certainly don't want to implicate ourselves to tax liability on the for-profit side so that relegated us to the partnership side of the decision uh, tree so we get over to the partnership side and we're like, okay, we've got all the, the big time attorneys helping us underwrite this deal. They didn't understand Indian country particularly well, but you know, they knew new markets, they'd done this, they've been in the space for 10 years. So we go in and we're like, okay, 
We need to establish a partnership. We have the Chickasaw Nation tribal government as the controlling entity. And then we established the minority partnership interests with Chickasaw Nation Industries Incorporated, a federally chartered corporation based on the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. Um, similar, it's like a Section 17 or Section mm -hmm. 17 of the Indian Reorganization. So we're like, okay, that meets the that meets the status for partnership. Good to go. Then <laughs> we we received certification uh, as a national CDE, which we're very thankful. Uh, for and received an, applic uh, an allocation as well. And we're like, all right, we're hitting the road running. We <laughs> start looking uh, to execute the allocation agreement, and we realized that though that we believed that that was, would meet the criteria for partnership, and it does in every other legal, from every other legal perspective, but from the Internal Revenue Code, it did not because one of them had to be for profit. And there's a specific revenue ruling for federally chartered corporations uh, under either of those acts, either the Oklahoma or the, or the Federal uh, Indian Reorganization Act. So then we had to establish yet again another entity and elect to be taxed as a C Corp. <laughs> and so we minimized that ownership to 10 BIPs, or one-tenth of 1% 1 of the partnership uh, that has established the Chickasaw Nation Community Development Endeavor. So I tell you um, lamentingly that you need to take a look at that. And if you want to take the nonprofit route, certainly start applying for that status so that you can ready yourselves for making us an application. If you want to take the partnership route, Know that somehow you're going to have to establish uh, an entity that has tax liability. And I know Andy's nodding his head. He's like, yeah, you should have known that. I mean, but we didn't, and we made that mistake. And it was something that, that we had to orient ourselves to. So um, let the minutes reflect that I, we told you about that. <laughs> Don't make the same mistake that we did. But we were, we were very, very happy with the response of this, the CDFI fund. Uh, Rosa and Joe, they were like, listen, we're not about taking away credits that, that especially for a community that needs it in any country. We're, we're here to work with you. We you know, provided a solution uh, at the call, and we were just open with it. We're like, hey, listen, we've made a mistake. Uh, we thought we were right. Turns out we weren't particularly right, and this is how we're going to fix it. Will you allow us to fix it? And they're like, absolutely. Let's make sure and vet this appropriately with our compliance team and whatnot, but we appreciate your candor and your transparency, and uh, it, I'm happy to report that we've had a smooth sailing since then, um, if there is such thing in any country. <laughs> now, this was a call to the CDFI fund? Absolutely. And so have you found them very responsive and, and yes, helpful sir. when you reached out to yes, them? Yes, sir. They've been very patient with me because, as I mean, you can tell from my draw, I literally come out of the middle of nowhere <laughs> in, in Oklahoma. So they've been patient with me and with the Chickasaw Nation as we orient ourselves to this program. So I, I've, I would encourage you to develop a relationship with the CDFI fund. Don't look to them as... Uh, uh, a, truly a sister agency to the Internal Revenue Service or anything like that. Like, they are here to help. Uh, and I believe Rosa, when she stands up here and, and, and says that she wants to create jobs, because if they, they had me and the Chickasaw Nation over a barrel, uh, and, and they worked with us and let us go ahead and move forward. And like I said, we've allocated the first allocation and have plans to allocate the second soon. Uh, in impact, shovel-ready projects in any country. Very good, and I agree. I, I've had have enjoyed spending some time with with the uh, CDFI representatives here, and the passion is palpable. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think they're definitely would be in my Wooster column of people mm -hmm. that are passionate about Indian country. I appreciate them very much, um, Mr. Ducheneau. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I got the you pronunciation did. right. Um, <laughs> Tell us about your, your CDE application. Was it, a, was it an easy process? Would you recommend them to look into that as a way to prep and get ready for work? I think work? I highly recommend it. I think for us that was probably the easiest thing. Uh, Julia, did you guys helped on that a little bit, I believe, right? And for us that was the easiest part to get everything going and underway. Um, 
So yeah, but I highly encourage, like Dakota said, not your tribal council, uh, intimate your lawyers with this stuff early on because especially if you're using someone that's got a particular bent to Indian country law or federal Indian law, this is a whole new realm. And, you know, that's why you have folks like Karen back there who are experts in this. And you got to find people like her to come in because for our attorneys, we had a couple of our tribal attorneys look at this kind of stuff too when we were when I was back with the tribe and it was just very good. Well, that uh, that concludes. We're actually four minutes over. I'm going to blame uh, Dakota for yeah. that. Um, but I want to say thank you so much uh, for the uh, Federal Reserve for hosting us here, for the work you're doing on, on behalf of Indian Country, for all of you caring enough to be here. And uh, Dakota and Wayne, thank you for sharing your expertise and being willing to uh, maybe field some calls in the future from uh, people who would be interested in picking your brain some more. And thank so you. So without further ado, thank you. Thank you.